Hello to all of you joining us from wherever you may be in the world and welcome to this side event at the UN Global Sustainable Transport Conference. My name is Andrew Stevens. I'll be your moderator uh, for this event and I'd like to thank the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs uh, for making this platform available to us to talk about what is an extremely important topic which is aviation's commitment to sustainable flying and how we can, indeed, how we must make it a reality. Over the next hour, we're gonna be taking a close look at the industry's sustainable flying strategy, and we'll also be doing a deep dive into the key element of that strategy, and that is sustainable aviation fuel. Now, SAF, as it's known, is, is a pretty well-known term within the aviation industry, but it's something of a mystery to a broader global audience. So that's something we want to rectify through conferences like this and also getting out and spreading the word more generally. Today, we're going to be joined by Sebastian Mikosh. Sebastian is the Senior Vice President of Aviation Environment at IATA. IATA, of course, is the trade association representing some 290 airlines. Uh, we'll also be listening to Sebastian, who will give us a short keynote speech on the industry's very new and very real commitment to net zero emissions in 2050. This is a amazing, this is a major step forward, given the fact that it puts the aviation industry in line with the Paris Agreement on global warming being limited to just 1.5 degrees. It's an aggressive commitment by the airline industry, given it is one of the hardest to abate industries anywhere, but it's also been unanimously accepted by the IATA board at its annual general meeting in Boston. That happened just two weeks ago. So an aggressive position, but full support of the airline industry. Following Sebastian, we're gonna be hearing from a panel of key players in this, uh, the sustainable aviation fuel on how it works, on how it actually cuts emissions and on how much, how we need to ramp up to get critical mass there. Now, many of you may know this, but some of you won't, is that uh, SAF is actually in use today. In fact, some of you who uh, traveled in person to Beijing uh, will probably have flown on an aircraft that actually had some SAF in its fuel tanks. Now, just before I hand over to Sebastian, I want to make sure you are aware that there is a question uh, session here. If you have questions for the panelists or for Sebastian, please just uh, go to the uh, question function, which is on the right of your screen. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sebastian for the keynote address. Sebastian. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I am really happy to be able to address you today. Um, and thanks, UN, also for letting us uh, have, this, uh, have this session, uh, because uh, I am very happy to, to share with you what is a truly um, historic news for, for, for our industry and that uh, Andrew um, alluded to. Uh, so I have, uh, we have a very precious one hour that I would like to use in the best possible, uh, uh, best possible way. So I'll start by sharing um, um, around eight, nine slides, but very, very quickly uh, to, to tell you more details on what we have been voting and discussing about exactly 11 days ago um, and uh, if we could go to the next to the next slide uh, exactly 11 uh, 11 days ago uh, we were um, in Boston uh, um, as uh, the General Assembly of, uh, of IATA so that's uh, uh, the most important and the biggest event our association and I might say our industry has uh, in in the year and during this uh, this AGM um, uh, we have been submitted uh, by our chairman, Robin, Robin Hayes, um, the proposal of a resolution uh, which would commit us as industry, um, on behalf of course of IAT and our members, to achieve a net zero carbon emission by 2050. Uh, so of course, uh, this, uh, this is, uh, I would say, a, a, a historic commitment, but not a new commitment. And I would like just to, to, to tell you that this is an extension of our commitment that we took in 2009 during the same event, which was an AGM of IATA in Kuala Lumpur, when we declared that uh, we're going to be uh, emitting 
half, uh, 50 by 50, so 50% 50 of our emissions by 2050 with a baseline as a 2005 uh, emission, uh, emission level. So our commitment prior to that was, was to emit not more than 325 million tons of CO2 by 2050. Now, you know, uh, 12 years have passed. Uh, the market con uh, the Paris Agreement was, uh, was signed. Um, there is a general market consensus we discussed with our members around uh, the, the, the Paris Agreement and 2050. So we had a number of discussions since many months among our members and it ended up by taking this, what I believe, historic, uh, historic uh, uh, commitment because we take it uh, very seriously and we want to uh, deliver, uh, deliver on it. So this resolution was voted by, uh, by acclamation and acclamation and now it's becoming uh, it has become our new uh, industry target and actually it's what we need to deliver. So the time of declaration has passed, now there is a time of delivery. So if we could go to the next, um, next slide. Um, before going to describe you what is our scenario and what is, uh, uh, what, what, how do we think we might achieve it, let me just share the, 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 the slides about the challenge. So the size of the challenge is that we as industry would like to continue growing. Our target is to continue carrying more and more passengers every uh, year. So the size of the challenge is that we would like to carry in 2050 uh, more than 10 billion passengers a year from uh, the 2 billion that we carried in 21. The speakers already have uh, embedded the COVID impact in it. That means that, means that in order to be uh, carbon neutral, we need to abate 1.8 gigatons of CO2 by 2050. Of course, we will not wait for 2050 to do it, but our whole uh, challenge is that we have to uh, continuously work on decreasing and have a gradual approach in order to arrive at a zero, uh, uh, maybe before, but not latest than 2050. How do we do it? If we could go to the next slide. So actually, you know, there is a plan, we can call it also a scenario. Of course, during the process of, of preparing this resolution, we had a, with our board of IATA a number of uh, discussions. Uh, the, the leaders of the industry have discussed it, uh, not only, by the way, uh, just in the board, but there was a number of internal uh, consultations on uh, what, are, what is the scenario, one of the possible scenario to, to get there. So, of course, we need to use a combination of measures or let's call it a technology blend using various, uh, various available uh, technologies. And this chart, this pie is presenting uh, what we believe is one of the possible plans, but this is a plan we, we, we believe on. And as you see, it's uh, around four pillars. So the usage of sustainable aviation fuel, uh, input of new technologies that are currently being developed, um, uh, 3 percent coming from infrastructure and operations and the 19 percent package of uh, offsetting various types of offsetting so that's what we believe would be our plan by 2050. Let me uh, walk you quickly through the details of that if we could go to the next slide please. So there is no secret and uh, it's been uh, IATA advocacy that our biggest belief uh, is today in SAP. Uh, SAF being the sustainable aviation fuel, it's a form of biofuel which is made uh, from sustainable sources. So the difference of uh, SAF is not in what the fuel is, but because but how is it made? Why we are a big believer? Because we believe that this is uh, a technology that we know, uh, we use it already. So uh, we uh, we are conscious of, uh, I mean, we have a knowledge uh, that uh, we can we can scale it and use it. So this is, um, we have a lot of answers to the questions about the uh, technology. Of course, there is a lot of challenges about the use of uh, the use of SAF. So as far as we, uh, we are using it at very small scale in our pl planes today, the, there are two big challenges. One of the challenge is the availability of SAF. So the capacity of actually increasing SAF by 10,000% over the next 29 years in terms of supply. And of course, uh, uh, the, the second challenge is to uh, obtain a much lower price than SAF is today, because uh, 
and SAP, as we speak, is up, up between two to three times more expensive than the classic fossil fuel that we operate today. Anyway, our belief is that 60%, 65% of our emission reductions needed in 2050 will come from this, uh, this technology, and this is why we are a very strong supporter of its development and growth. But not only SAP, if we could go further, we also believe that uh, about around 13% um, will come from new propulsion systems. We are nevertheless quite conservative about this figure because you see this figure concerns again 2050. Uh, so we believe that there will be new solutions on electric, hybrid, hydrogen propulsion. But as I speak to you and as we've been going through that pathway, we do not have enough answers to the questions about the price of the technology, its certification process, its availability, and especially, will it be able to solve what is the key of our problem, which is the long haul flights? As we speak, we know that those new propulsion technology has, has, uh, are, are being you know, worked on. You can see in the media, if you follow a number of announcements around tests and even starts of certifications of electric planes, for example. But we also know, as this table is showing, that this um, um, these planes, this, this new uh, uh, propulsion systems are viable as we speak for small planes and short distances. Nevertheless, we assume that by 2050, this 13% will, uh, will be available and that will bring us an additional in-sector decarbonization mean. Of course, we're going to also count on improved, uh, improved of our operations. Thank you for the next slide. And the, the, uh, but I would say that this is very little, this is only 3% by 2050. Why? Because we can measure this very precisely, because this is business as usual, if I may say. So this is what our airlines already do. Uh, we retrofit winglets, we have uh, uh, light, different lightweight programs, you know, management, fuel management systems, for example, uh, uh, reduced engine taxing, which is called single engine taxes, uh, taxing. Uh, we are, of course, uh, uh, pushing very much for have uh, to, to have improvements like single European skies. Uh, we ref, uh, we uh, wash uh, engines to have less fuel consumptions, or we do continuous improvements in in the planes, in the in the software. So these are the things that are already part of of how we operate. Therefore, we estimate that it will continue over time, and even if we fly more and more and operate uh, more, it will give us uh, the additional three percent. Then last but not least, if we could go to the fourth part of the pie, thank you. So it's offset. And offsetting for us, it's clearly uh, a gap filler. So we want to use offsetting uh, to compensate what we can not reduce by ourselves due to uh, the, uh, lack of availability, for example, of SAP or not enough uh, supply of new propulsion systems. And actually our offsetting plan is divide, divided into the offsetting we know today through the system called Corsia, which is uh, which is uh, an ICAO, also a UN agency initiated uh, system, which we are very strongly supporting. Uh, but we know that, first of all, this system has a timeline in it, this agreement has a timeline in it by 2035, but also that the availability of SAP will be decreasing. Therefore, we estimate that by 2050, we will be using around 8% coming from uh, reliance on offsets. So we will buy the right from other people to. Uh, pollute. Uh, and what we really want to do is to uh, increase very strongly the carbon capture. Uh, carbon capture is one of the technologies which is nascent, but it's, uh, it, uh, it consists in car car capturing uh, CO2 and turning it into stones, basically. Um, and this is uh, also a very expensive technology, but we all know that this is a technology that has a great future. IPCC report, for example, was quoting this technology and one of the ones of the necessary means to go further in decarbonization of our planet. And this is what we as airline would like to very much count on. By the way, few of our airlines already invested in startups that are producing and uh, developing carbon capture. We will not do it by ourselves. So all of this, of course, it's our airline commitment. Uh, uh, and what we need, uh, uh, and this is a very strong mm -hmm. message I'm giving to, uh, to the UN, uh, is uh, we need support. Uh, um, this. Uh, a uh, commitment is, of course, our airline commitment. So I, I will be very clear that we know that we're going to have to put the price in it, to put the effort in it, and we have to be part of our 
genetic code is also to look at uh, aviation not only through safety and growth of business but also through uh, the, the impact on, on environment but we will need a strong support from oil producers and we have a representative today for, for our panel from various corporates from research and have public money available not to us airlines but to the research that will make those technology um, available uh, and of course we need also the support of our passengers not only through their contribution but also through their push on public various public authorities and all the value chain of aviation to deliver this target because as i mentioned the declarations are there now we have to be uh, uh, showing that we are delivering and that our industry is very uh, serious about it and in 2050 when this panel will take place we will be uh, reporting uh, zero net emission that would be it from me andrew thank you very much and uh, i'll be with pleasure here staying asking uh, answering your questions thanks very much Thanks very much, Sebastian. Uh, as Sebastian says, he will be staying with us for this deeper dive now into sustainable aviation fuel. Um, as he said, uh, we've got some serious ramping up to be done. Ten is got to increase by some 10,000%, uh, as, as um, Sebastian points out. Um, there are pathways, as you saw, there are clear pathways, but it's very clear that SAT is the key at this stage. And it may change, that uh, equation may change in the years to come, but certainly right now uh, it is SAT is the key, key issue here. So let's turn now to our panel. Haldane Dodd is the Acting Director General of ATAG. ATAG is the Air Transport Action Group. Now, it's a, uh, an independent coalition that represents pretty much the entire air transport industry, the airlines, of course, Airline, uh, aircraft and engine manufacturers, airports, air navigation service providers, right down to pilots unions and aviation associations, all represented by ATAG. And ATAG has also just published a key report, which is an updated report, actually, a research paper on the pathways to reaching that net zero CO2 that uh, Sebastian was talking about by 2050. Grace Chung is the head of sustainability at Cathay Pacific. Uh, Cathay, of course, based in Hong Kong. Cathay also a very early adopter uh, in the SAF world, uh, and it's also set some pretty aggressive targets in its own strategy of reaching uh, net zero emissions by 2050. And Thorsten Langer is the Executive Vice President of Renewable Aviation at Neste Oil. Now, Neste is the world's biggest producer currently of sustainable aviation fuel. I'm sure, um, Thorsten, you want to make sure it stays that way. Uh, current production, SAF production, is around 100,000 tonnes, which is expected to rise at Neste to 1.5 million tonnes uh, towards the end of 2023. So as you can see, there's exponential growth there uh, of SAF at Neste. So thank you to our panellists for making the time to join us. Haldane, I'd like to think, think, kick things off with you. And I want to go back to basics to a degree and just explain what actually qualifies for SAF and is there enough raw material to reach that, that industry target? We, we heard uh, Sebastian talking about that monumental increase in SAF needed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for having us uh, speak with you today and uh, greetings to uh, everybody. Um, I think it's important also to follow up on, on what Sebastian said uh, with the airline agreement uh, on getting to net zero. The whole industry has has also followed that uh, the, the day afterwards, in fact, uh, with an agreement across the entire aviation industry. Uh, I think we're one of the first industries in the world to have a global uh, net zero uh, by 2050 uh, goal um, as as a whole sector uh, and it's really important uh, to, to make sure that we can now get on the road to, to getting uh, getting there of course um, and you mentioned uh, Andrew uh, at the start the fact that we had put together um, a uh, an analysis of how we're going to actually meet that net zero goal uh, it's called waypoint 2050 and it's, it's available uh, on, on our website now um, it's, it's important to note also that uh, it's not just SAF, there's also technology, there's operational uh, and, and infrastructure uh, uh, opportunities there, but SAF does make up uh, the biggest uh, part of that. Um, and you know, core question is around that first word of sustainable aviation fuel, sustainable. It needs to be sustainable if we're going to uh, start using it. We don't want to repeat the mistakes uh, that we saw in some other sectors where they were 
um, going down the road, uh, literally in road transport of using uh, biofuels which were not sustainable and causing all sorts of other problems uh, later on. So sustainability is key. Um, the, the whole industry is agreed on this and, and ensuring that we're making sure that uh, any kind of uh, new types of fuel that we use uh, do follow strict sustainability uh, criteria. Um, and it also needs to work uh, in our aircraft and engines. There's a, a huge testing program that goes on every single time uh, a new pathway or a new feedstock uh, is identified to make sure that it works, that it's safe, um, and that we can use it, uh, and also uh, follows up on the sustainability side of things. Um, as part of, uh, of the Waypoint project, uh, we also looked at where the fuel can come from, where the sustainable aviation fuel can come from uh, over the next 30 years. Um, and there's going to be an evolution in that as well. Uh, from the types of uh, sustainable aviation fuel that we use today, which mainly comes from uh, waste resources, uh, waste oils and lipids, um, and, and some other uh, sources of, of waste material uh, through the heifer process. Uh, towards more advanced uh, opportunities with alcohol to jet, um, and then moving into power to liquid uh, opportunities later on, literally producing uh, aviation fuel from electricity. Um, it's, it's, it's a really exciting uh, opportunity, very expensive today, uh, but one that we think will make up the bulk of um, our SAF supply uh, in the future. So there are a range of opportunities, um, and uh, the, the, the work that we did with Waypoint shows that it is possible to meet the needs of the industry, uh, even if we were to go to almost 100% SAF by 2050 uh, through sustainable sources, uh, there are the resources available to do that as well as uh, for use in other sectors as well. Um, so I'll leave it at that uh, for the moment, but uh, just a mm. reflection there. An absolutely key point, there is enough uh, feedstock, there is enough uh, technology and pathways to get us to where we need to go. Uh, Grace Chung, um, Cathay, obviously uh, an early mover on SAF, uh, and you have now pledged that you will be using 10% SAF uh, ratio in all your flights by 2030, which uh, in, in, in the airline world is a very aggressive target. Just explain to us, given the fact that there is so little SAF produced at the moment, how are you going to get to that 10% figure? Thanks for that question, Andrew. 10% SAF by 2030 is indeed a very ambitious target. Um, but I think Cathay is lucky. We have got quite a good start. Back in 2014, Cathay was the first airline investor in one of the leading SAF manufacturers at that time, Fulcrum Bio Energy. And besides equity stake in Fulcrum, Cathay has also uh, agreed to an offtake agreement when Fulcrum starts producing its SAF. We have committed to take 35 million gallons um, of it from uh, Fulcrum each year over a 10 year um, period. So it would be enough to cover roughly 2% of our annual fuel um, demand on a pro in a pre-COVID-19 operating level. So that, um, that has given us a very good starting point in order to reach our 10% um, target. But of course, since our investment in Fulcrum, we've been talking to different SAF manufacturers over the years and will continue those conversations to secure additional supply in the next few years to come. Uh, we'll move on to cost in a moment, Grace, but I just want just wanted to ask you, if you just explain to us, what is the fulcrum process? What is their feedstock that they're using? Um, one reason why we invested in fulcrum is that we really like their use of municipal solid waste as feedstock. And they have secured long-term um, contract with um, nearby governments to actually not spending money to acquire feedstock, but actually getting paid to get rid uh, to get rid of those um, municipal solid waste. So that gives them a very solid business model to start uh, with making SAF. And of course, um, adding to that all the incentive from um, government to incentivize the production of SAF and also the usage of SAF, um, especially in West Coast USA. I think that gives them a very good starting position. I want to turn now to, to Thorsten. Speaking of early movers, obviously, Thorsten, Neste was pretty much in at the birth of SAF, and you're now the world's biggest producer. How easy is it to develop SAF? Uh, and what processes do you use? And, and do you have to build completely new refineries? Uh, where do you get the feedstock? Yeah, um, thanks, Andrew. Very good questions. And uh, maybe I would start with, uh, and, and modifying your question a bit, how easy is it to develop SAF? The question is, how easy was it? Because it has been developed. And it's not only um, the technology we are talking about currently in Nest and, and Halden was referring to that have technologies, 
there's a lot of other pathways that have already been approved. Uh, Grace was referring to municipal waste. Um, there is uh, algae being approved. Uh, we have a oligonocellulosis and also the PTL pathways are there already. So how, how easy is it? It was not easy, it was difficult. And it started a long time ago already. Um, knowing we have 2021 now, I mean, the first test flights already took place in 2010. So we had start, started our journey much, much earlier. Um, and as you can imagine, I mean, as we always say, there's no hard shoulder in the sky. There has been profound research going on before starting that. Um, but this is all said and done. It's a safe technology. It's a drop-in technology. It's something that is ready for use now, and it's available now. When it comes to production, because that was the other part of your question, um, that was not an easy task. Uh, you had to start somewhere, and actually Nestle was always a front runner in, in, in sustainable or more sustainable technologies in our very complex refinery that we have in Porvo, in Finland, actually. We were the first, you know, with low lead, with no lead, gasoline. Uh, so it already kind of, you know, was showing the way um, and, and paving the way um, going into renewables here. Um, as we don't have any, any upstream business, um, we, we, we're focusing on refining and we are specialized in refining. And this is where we developed our next, uh, next base technology, uh, next BTL technology that we then started to to uh, develop and to build attached to our current refinery in Helsinki in Porvo already in 2007. And that, that had then been followed by uh, our production facility in Rotterdam and then in Singapore. So this is going on for 11 years already, mainly on the renewable uh, um, roadside, uh, but now adding um, stuff. When entering into stuff, it certainly requires a bit more. And as you can imagine, this is also really a costly exercise because at the beginning, you have to run your refineries kind of suboptimal, you know, to, to making sure you get the stuff out. So it's, it's a costly game at the beginning. And unfortunately, it remains to be a costly game. So if I may refer a bit to what, uh, what Grace was just saying, yes, maybe currently municipal waste is there for free, but building such refineries, is quite an effort. It costs a lot of money. And, um, and talking about you know, size of refineries, um, I'm very much in favor and would say it's the best way to having large units. Because there's always people talking about, you know, why not having little, little units uh, next, uh, next to where the waste is coming? Um, I have my doubts that that is really working. Um, so um, bigger units, uh, the bigger the units, the better. And then we also can talk about a slight impact on the economies of scale. Okay, th thanks, Lars. So we, we're going to explore the, the, the cost questions a just a little bit later. Later, I just want to quickly turn to Sebastian now. Uh, you, you, you alluded to the to the fact, Sebastian, in your presentation that uh, this is a collaborative effort, obviously, uh, to get the all technology partners and all partners in, in the industry on side. I wanted to ask you if you could explain a little bit more specifically what has to happen, what do partners have to do right now as far as ramping up SAF because this is the key ingredient. We know there is enough feedstock now. We've, we've heard about various pathways. What needs to be done by the aviation partners themselves? So I'll start by saying that what needed to be done, I hope, was done by having a resolution which gives a very strong signal that our industry will provide demand. So, you know, it's this question of chicken and egg. We decided it's the chicken. We're going to say, we airlines are going to buy SAF. Of course, we want it cheaper, but we will buy it. We know, we know what Thorsten mentions about the investment. We know it, uh, but it's the way we want to go forward. So number one was to say that we are very serious and it will cost us money. That's, that's for sure, the number, number one. Now, what we want to ask in the meantime is two things. Of course, uh, uh, for us, you know, we, we don't, we cannot continuously or we don't want to continuously turn to government. So first we turn to people like Thorsten and we want to tell them, we want you to continue to be the first in terms of size so you can invest. Yes, of course, the cheaper you make it, the, the more we will be buying quicker. Because the point is, uh, which I didn't mention in my presentation, is that for the moment, as we speak, uh, um, we cannot put more than 50% of SAF in our blend. Yeah, there is a technological limit, but we all know that this technological limit will go because 
exactly SAT is an existing fuel. So it's not a question of if, but when. So first, we need to say to people who are supplying this fuel until now, please supply just a different one. So uh, that's the that's the first message uh, because we, you know, we've been in this value chain for 100 years now since we started having the first flight. Number two is to, for example, and that's I'm very pleased to quote, uh, use the example of the US administration to say each technology transition, each energy transition has been supported by public policies. We don't want public policies to support us as airlines, but we want public policies to be like in the US when there is a tax credit that incentivizes oil producers to shift their capacity from biodiesel to SAP and to deliver. So, so they have a, a positive incentive, not taxation, not mandate, but an incentive saying, like for the electric cars, we want the industry to buy it. So we will we will stimulate the supply because the demand will be there by a public action. That's the best, I guess, uh, in terms of quick shift because everybody will find it way in there. Prosten will find it, well, uh, Grace will find it, and I'll find it. So we will all, and how they will, we will write an excellent report about it. That is going to be exactly how we should be, uh, how we should be going forward. And this is what we ask in our advocacy toward our partners. Thanks, Sebastian. I want to stay on this topic of uh, what Sebastian mentioned and turn it over to Hal Dane, um, talking about tax credits and what the US is doing. There are obviously different pathways adopted by different governments on support for SAF. For example, the EU is looking at a mandate to Hal Dane. What, from ATAG's point of view, do you think is critical to get everyone on, on the right page? And does there have to be a one-size-fits-all government to this, or can it be fragmented with different governments? Yeah, I, I think it's unrealistic to expect uh, that there'll be one-size-fits-all approach across the world. There are just too many different uh, regional uh, approaches to policy making, uh, national approaches to policy making as well. Um, different countries will look at this in different ways. I think that there are um, some key uh, factors that need to go into any kind of decision making. Um, and I, I would sort of suggest that if, if possible for governments and policymakers to resist looking at the easy approach or the very blunt approach of just going after a mandate or just going after a tax um, when thinking about uh, doing the incentive building for, for SAF. I mean, the whole point here is to, to make sure that we can start building this industry so it exists by itself uh, in the future anyway. Um, it's going to take a bit more time to actually put in uh, the effort to actually put in place a comprehensive hydrogen strategy or SAF strategy um, over a long period of time. It has to include both carrot and stick uh, policy approaches, but you're going to get a better result in the end uh, if, if, if you just follow um, a, a simple mandate and then leave it at that. And just to give you an example, if, if we were to have a 10% blend mandate instituted tomorrow, um, actually all that does is really increase uh, the price of that fuel um, because uh, the supply just doesn't exist um, uh, at, at the moment. So gradual uh, increases in mandates over time could potentially be part of it, but that also needs to be underpinned uh, by support to make sure that the, uh, the, the supply of SAF uh, is available uh, across the system as well. You can't just have one part of that. Uh, it has to be a comprehensive approach. Just on that point, uh, Hal Dane, what is, has your research uh, indicated to you about the, the, the ramping up of SAF? What, what do we need, what targets do we need to hit to get the right levels by 2050? Well, again, that depends kind of on which part of the world that you're talking about. Um, certainly some parts of the world will get uh, to higher blend mandates or, or blend uh, in the system much faster than other parts of the world. Um, but I think the important thing is that this can be done everywhere. Um, the, the work that we did not only looked at it at a global level, but also a regional level as to where the potential supply of SAF could come from. And of course, different regions have different opportunities that exist. Um, at the moment, uh, I heard a statistic the other day that 22 countries produce 90% of the world's oil. Um, and the, the beauty of SAF is that you can actually uh, democratize that and, and, and decentralize that supply of energy and create energy industries in various different countries uh, around the world, not just those that supply our energy today. Um, so there are real opportunities that exist everywhere. Great. I want to stick with government policy for the moment because as, as, as a buyer and uh, as a consumer, 
what do you see when you look globally at government action to support SAF, which you think is currently the most effective? I will echo uh, what uh, Hagen mentioned earlier. I think a basket of policy approach definitely works much better than just go for one simple way to make it happen. So is uh, considering the different factors, both incentive and supporting the creation of a market, giving both supplier and user the incentive to use it to scale it up. But those um, top policy uh, approach um, we've talked um, a bit about already and going down to the sort of like, what's the next step if, um, if, if government uh, or policymaker can consider? One model we see quite successful is in a number of those airports around the world leading SAF usage. They have formed some sort of cross-sectoral coalition like with policymakers, regulators, airlines, airport authorities, and um, um, fuel supply company, basically all the stakeholders who need to play a role in um, scaling up SAF usage from that particular um, place, get together, get the understanding up, get the alignment up, and get it started. Let's start from one place. How do we get consistent SAF supply from here? And it could be sort of like just a small amount at the beginning, but that's how you get this started. And all that learning, all that experience can then be duplicated and replicated in other places. I think uh, instead of or not just doing um, um, the policy talk, we also need to start um, getting some uh, real action in place to um, to really kickstart the process. Uh, Torsten, fr fr from a producer's point of view, again, the, the, the government question, uh, do you feel that there is a certain amount of enlightenment from governments around the world as you look at um, expanding SAF production, or are, are there obstacles that you, you believe that have to be approached now? Well, let's maybe first uh, give it a second thought when talking about incentives and, and mandates. You know, what, what, the, what the industry needs is demand certainty. Um, how that is created is one thing, and I see both incentives as well as, as mandates playing an, playing an important role. And if you see, you know, the mandates that we're just discussing, especially in Europe, we're we talking about small portions here that are somewhat aligned also with the availability. And by the way, I don't think that, that, that the goals we currently have in the refuel EU aviation are ambitious enough, but this is something we are discussing. Um, but I also think, you know, the industry and also the end users need a little nudge. And if I may say, also thinking about, you know, how uh, how attractive flying was in the past, everybody could fly for almost each price, is something we have to have in mind and we have to discuss. Plus, flying being too cheap um, to just be more precise here. So I see this, you know, playing all together um, a certain role. Um, when we're talking about um, the schemes and the policies here, one thing is important, and you asked me earlier the question about the feedstock and about the availability, and how then said, well, there is no, you know, there is no issues on, on availability, and I would totally agree. Um, already when we're talking about the current HEFA technology, there is enough feedstocks, but what we see is um, 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 a certain narrow view on the on, on eligible feedstocks, if you so will. So we're not allowing all the feedstocks that are fully sustainable. And don't take me wrong, the industry is not looking for feedstocks that are not sustainable and that are not meeting those requirements. But there's more out than those that are just being considered in the refuel EU aviation, for example. So a, bright, a broader look on those things is definitely required. And then along the HEFA technology would be able um, um, to unleash around 200 million tons of feedstocks, half of them being able to be used for SAF and the other going into renewable diesel side. So have the incentive schemes, have the mandates, have research funded. This is certainly still something that we have to have. I agree, no taxes, because uh, uh, history tells you taxes have never led to anything. I mean, nobody is sure where the money really is going. So it has to be an insected solution that we're striving for. But be more open-minded on the feedstocks. Let's sit together with the, with the governmental bodies, with policymakers, also with NGOs, to clarify what is it that can be accepted. And start with what we just have. That would be my plea. I want to move to Sebastian. Um, Torsten. Uh, it's sort of indicating fairly clearly, Sebastian, that the, the price 
of SAF uh, is likely to stay higher to a degree than it is fossil fuels. We are recovering, from, we, when I say we, the aviation industry is recovering from the worst crisis it's ever faced. It's, it, the, the balance sheets are, have been devastated. Can airlines afford SAF? Ah, difficult question. Uh, no, so first, first, uh, uh, you know, I heard Thorsten saying something which which you can definitely work on, which is demand certainty. And again, um, it's not only uh, just about us complaining that uh, a new technology will be more expensive because it will be more expensive. That you know, of course. The the question is the long term, not that much the short term. So. Uh, this is definitely uh, an area in which we can make we can make substantial efforts. Um, you, you know, a decision like uh, like Cathay decision to go to 10%. Uh, I mean, it's a fundamental demand decision, and so it means that the airline will provide demand. So actually, you have a customer who, before even I guess negotiating, already said he's going to be buying. Normally, in our industry, you first negotiate and then you depending on the price you, you put you put the volume so we have a different approach to, to to the environment because we know that to some extent it's going to cost i mean i'm saying to some extent because of course as rational airlines we will try to make this cost as low as possible that's also part of uh, how we run uh, how we run our uh, our business but then i believe that uh, the the um, and i'm I'm referring also to, to what Haldane did. I said there, there will be a demo, democratization of this process, and if there is a support in getting more different technologies, okay, now we have like seven technologies to produce that. If we have more technologies being certified, and if, for example, PTL, which is the, the turning de facto a green energy into, into fuel by capturing also CO2, uh, is much cheaper, then we'll have an, another alternative. So, we are in a market that we need to stimulate. And of course, all of us want this market to be the largest and the cheapest possible. So Thorsten's job will be to explain that it needs to be expensive. My job will be to explain that we want to buy it and it needs to be cheaper. And now, you know, the whole idea is that our two lines are crossing and we buy more and more and more and more because actually this is what we have to do until we have a non, um, non fossil or non fuel solution, which is a different propulsion system, which will be certified like hydrogen, and then I'll buy from Torsten hydrogen, or uh, some form of electric propulsion, which today, just simply from, from physics perspective, is not what we have at hand. This is why it's all about SAF. Thank, thanks, Sebastian. If I can bring Haldane into this, uh, two, two interesting, very clear points of view there from, from Sebastian and from Torsten on the, the future of SAF and, and prices to a degree. Now, Dan, your research, Waypoint 2050, did that uncover uh, an issue about the, the price of SAF having to be high, or do you think that there is uh, a, a happy medium, if you like? So it looked at it in two different ways. Uh, first of all, the uh, investment that's going to be required in new SAF production facilities over the 30-year period, um, and the the number uh, that uh, that was developed for the maximum use of SAF uh, is very high. It's 1.5 uh, trillion uh, US dollars over that 30-year period. Um, but when you annualize that, it's around about six percent of typical oil and gas uh, capital expenditure uh, every year uh, before COVID. Um, so actually that's not out of the realm of possibility. It's around about the uh, amount of liquid fuel that we use today as an industry for aviation uh, anyway, out of the total uh, economy wide. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's a doable number. Um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, then you have to look at the cost of the SAF itself. Now, I think at the moment we're, we're in an unusual situ situation where you have a very small number of producers of SAF uh, and there's a reasonable demand for it, um, for, for that small quantity that's, that's coming out at the moment. It is quite high at the moment. I would 
argue that uh, some of the producers are taking advantage of that at the moment. But as we know, actually, there's going to be a significant market for SAF uh, over the next 30 years. We want to get to almost 100%, if not 100% of our fuel supply from SAF um, over that period. Um, and so there's going to be enough room for everybody uh, to play in that market. Um, and the, uh, the the analysis that, uh, that we did uh, showed that the price will come down. Um, it will come down uh, to within the historical uh, spread of, of jet fuel prices that we've seen over the last 20 years. Of course, jet fuel as, as normal oil uh, prices goes up and down quite a lot. Um, that's if you include the cost of carbon, and that's a, that's a key part of the equation. Uh, including that cost of carbon actually uh, over time will bring the cost of SAF down to within what we would expect uh, and what we can survive with as an industry. Key question from a lot of passengers, I guess, is will the cost of flying go up? And we just don't really know how to answer that today. It's possible that it might go up a bit, um, but actually our industry is very efficient. We've been able to increase efficiency uh, a lot uh, over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, so the cost of travel today is relatively low. It might go up a little bit, um, but the important thing there is to make sure that we keep connecting the world um, and to do it sustainably. Maybe there's a, a bit of a cost to doing that. I, I want to turn to, to the production side of this now. Um, at, at the moment, SAF is focused, or SAF production seems to be focused on the west coast of the US, in, in Europe and in Singapore with Nestle, of course. And Grace, I want to turn to you. Um, do you see for example, Asia becoming more of a hub for SAF production. Do you see uh, the Asian part of the world being able to take this as a new, as a greenfields industry and, and really develop it? Thanks for the question, Andrew. I definitely think Asia has a very important role to play as the world scale up is um, SAF demand. Um, in fact, a lot of the feedstock for SAF production currently, um, whether it's produced in Europe or the States, many of those feedstock are actually collected in, in the Asia region. But because of the incentive offered, um, either the finished product or the feedstock themselves got shifted across the world to um, places where the incentives are there, incentivizing the production of SAF or biodiesel, for example. So I think the feedstock is already there. What's lacking is the incentive for um, staff manufacturer to go into the region to producing it there huh? because um, um, the demand would be there. And we'll definitely see that changing, I think, in the next few decades. For instance, I don't know if, you, if you're aware, but China is actually one of the world's largest bioethanol producers uh, with an annual output of more than 4 billion liters. Um, that's because of a supportive uh, national policy. So I think, as and when the policy environment changes, uh, we believe that SAF can take off extremely quickly in this part of the world. Uh, can, I, can I put that question to, to Thorsten? Um, how global do you think SAF production can be? Purely global, if you ask me. And uh, Grace just mentioned it, you know, uh, talking about the supply streams. Um, I think, uh, just think about the oil business as it was. It was a global game play it doesn't it's maybe not the right word but it was a global thing and so will renewable um, and stuff be um i don't see as i said uh, before that you know mini or micro refineries being spread around the world i see um bigger units larger units um as we do that in singapore and we just announced that we will be building another uh, refinery not not said yet when um in europe um and then you know the, uh, the supply streams will do. And the supply streams are part of the overall LCA calculation, so the life cycle analysis. It's not just about the fuel itself, it's, it's including everything. Also, the transport street, uh, uh, streams, supply streams, all that is included, and that very much favors, you know, some spots rather than have it spread. But will it be a global business? Yes. Um, will it be a job machine? This is something we maybe haven't taken into consideration yet, just to give you some food for thought. There was a number from the UK government saying if we just increase the soft production domestically um, in the UK, um, it, would it would produce roughly um, 10 to 11,000 jobs. And, and the UK is just 5% of the world consumption. So just think a bit about what job generating machine sustainable aviation fuel could be. We're talking about two to two and a half million people that would get new, highly paid or better paid jobs. So it will be a global business. It has to be a global business. Also because our customers are global 
aviation is a global business. It has to be seen differently, you know, from, from Renewable Road and all the other things where you have regional specific markets. Here, it's a global game, yes. So Sebastian, on that point, is this something the aviation or the airline industry should be lobbying for with governments about opening their eyes to the potential of SAF as, as, as a job creator, as, as a greenfields industry? Oh yes, definitely. And this is one of the key messages we, we, were, we were continuously giving, that uh, we see it as a big opportunity uh, to create new and high value added jobs, because this is uh, uh, this is a new market that literally was not existing 15 years ago, and now it's a market which which we all not only need to scale up, but we need to invest in. So it's it's in, not only in the production, but in a continuous research to add uh, to add new technology. So uh, you know our industry was always a high um, contributor to GDP and high contributor to, to to jobs, not only because of the employment we have, but particularly of what is called the multiplying factor that. Uh, you know, when we put one plane in operations, we create a massive number of jobs uh, for servicing the plane and by carrying people to the place uh, when this plane uh, is going. So th this is why we are so strongly supportive this incentive part, because the government, we don't ask them just to invest, you know, in an empty box. It's, a, it's an investment, actually, that will see the, the return very quickly through the GDP and particularly through the fact of, of, of an increased high qualified employment. Uh, I just want to come back quickly to Thorsten on this. Um, how would you describe the awareness among governments of SAF at this stage? Because it has been said, and I've, I've heard it, that, uh, you know, and as I alluded to in, in the introduction, that it's still not a very well-known industry at all. Are governments getting it at this stage? There's still a long way to go, Andrew. And and, and that's something we all, all of us have to do together. High tech. IATA, the airlines, the producers, I mean, talk to the governments, make them aware. I personally have been in meetings where people were asking, well, what, what is that? I mean, they don't, they don't know the, the, the soft word itself. They don't know what the product is. They still have concerns about, can we really fly with that? Does it smell like French fries? You know, all that funny questions that you're getting there. Um, so they know that there is something, but they haven't understood that it's available yet. And more importantly, None of the governments, and, and we are just at an UN event here. I mean, why are, is not every UN, let's say, rescue flight, uh, whatever flight, is already using stuff? Why are the governments not using stuff? You know, to being a role model here um, and, and to, to really being a front runner. This is something that needs the effort from all the stakeholders, and the governments are playing a crucial role here to understanding, to accepting, but also to be, you know, a role model to using that. Why is, you know, my German chancellor not flying with SAF? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, all those things uh, we have to do and educate, educate, educate. It's such an important topic uh, that we have to, uh, that we have to deal with. And there's still millions of people out there who are not, who don't know what we're talking about. And this is something we have to do jointly, definitely. Um, how, how they, it's, there is a school of thought that says, well, we can't, airlines can't use SAF, we can't use SAF because it's not produced near us and we don't have access to it. Can you just explain how we get around this using the, the, the book and claim system? Yeah, um, absolutely. It's it's one of these sort of, uh, sounds like a bit of a technical accounting term, and, and it is because it, it is an accounting term, but um, it's actually quite an important uh, part of the process that we need, particularly in the early years to make sure that we can uh, bring SAF on. What it means is basically that um, as, as an accounting mechanism, uh, you can, as an airline, purchase uh, sustainable aviation fuel, um, that it gets entered into the system more broadly, um, but that you can take the credit uh, for using uh, that fuel. You don't necessarily need to use those molecules in your own tank of your own aircraft. Um, and the important thing for that is that it can uh, ensure that we pick up the SAF uh, anywhere it is produced around the world, that we don't need to necessarily ship um, or truck that SAF to the airports in which my particular airline is flying out of, um, but that it can be used in the system more broadly. Um, but we can account for that. Um, and that's, that's going to be key, uh, particularly in the next maybe 15 or 20 years um, as we build this up. Once SAF starts being produced around the world and once we start being able to pick it up at airports around the world, it'll become less important, but it's a key part of actually getting us uh, on that road uh, to getting more and more SAF into the system. 
And Grace, if I could just ask you to, to, to contribute to, to the book and claims conversation. Uh, is it something that CAFE is using? Are you, you're supportive of it? We are definitely uh, supportive of a solid, robust and internationally compatible book and claim system. I think that's the key, is that that system is not a bilateral, it's not just um, between one airline or the other, but it's a well-established system that is trustworthy, used by set producer, airlines, and also our clients as well. Because Andrew, you asked earlier, what, what other support we need? Even corporate clients can play, can play their part, and we have seen in the market that a number of companies already partnering uh, with certain airlines for the use of SAF, so that um, they help cover the price gap between fossil fuel and SAF. The airline benefit um, to use more SAF, the SAF manufacturing, manufacturer benefits by increased demand, and the corporate itself also getting the benefit from indirect emission reduction. But for all this to be kept um, to like track properly, we need a solid book and claim system and not just working bilaterally for um, whoever in that supply chain, but well recognized by everybody so that the um, um, carbon emission reduction credit get properly accounted for. Because uh, the same as sustainability criteria, we are also very care about the um, sort of like the, um, the accounting for the um, reduction credit. We, do not want any of the double counting or anyone riding on the system um, to gain benefit without doing the real good for the environment. Okay, um, um, I've just been checking the questions box. It's, uh, there's, there's a resounding silence coming from our audience. So hopefully uh, all the questions are being and have been answered. So we, we, we are uh, drawing to the end. Um, I, I would like, if I could, before I thank our, our panelists to um, uh, Sebastian, if you could just make a few closing comments. Oh, thanks, Andrew. No, I, I think uh, that the, the, the two words that I'm taking away uh, as actually uh, a homework to do uh, is education and cooperation. Uh, is, uh, education is, is the fundament of it because this is a national technology and uh, it's true that I also had meetings when I was mentioning SAF and then at the end of the meeting, but what SAF means exactly? And this is a big challenge for us. I also have sometimes various people asking me, can it really go safely inside a plane? So we still are at a stage where it's not about uh, very sophisticated uh, parts of uh, you know, how to create demand, but really about building the, the base through, through the education. And then there will be no no success if we don't cooperate because uh, it's it's not only an airline challenge, it's not only an airline problem, it's across the whole spectrum. Likewise, the target, the climate target is, is not a you know mono-organization problem, but it's something that is really uh, horizontal for, 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 for everyone. So but I, I'm I'm quite uh, reassured about cooperation you know, ATAC state lands and all the fact that we just talk and we know all of, all of us and we know each other, we know who, who needs to talk to who. So cooperation is there and will, will, be, will be continuing. It's, it's really maybe this education part that is, uh, thanks to discussions like this, we need to pursue, expand, continue and, and convey everywhere. So that would be my closing word. I, I, I fully endorse that. Um, as you say, it's education, and hopefully, from uh, from webinars like this, um, people can take away a, a better understanding and, and keep spreading the message because it needs to be spread. It's a global industry, aviation. It's a global problem. It's uh, it's climate change. So, um, with that, I would like to thank our guests, Haldane Dodd, Grace Chung, and Thorsten Langer, for making your time available today, and of course, to Sebastian Nikosh at IATA. Thanks, Sebastian, for your time. Um, I hope that was a worthwhile hour for you. And um, go forward and spread the word. <laughs>